Good morning. It's Wednesday morning. We are in the histories. We are 2 Chronicles chapters 22, 23, 24. And I want to go straight to the heart of chapter 23 because there's a coup that's taken place and uh, the one that is in power is about to be usurped. And when you read that, you think, well, that's terrible, isn't it? Um, only, only is it? Um, the, the verse that struck me as I was reading through this in chapter 23 of Second Chronicles is when uh, Athaliah, um, we'll come to this woman a little bit in a moment and think about her, but she is about to be dis- deposed. She comes into the temple area. She sees another king that's now been installed and she calls out treason, treason. Um, and that sounds like a terrible crime, doesn't it? A crime against the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is being taken away from her and she cries out treason. The one who's doing this is doing the wrong thing. Only... Perhaps we ought to stop at this point and say there's a great danger in human nature that we can condemn in others what we permit in ourselves. Uh, When you come through the New Testament, you get that same idea being presented as the idea of hypocrisy. And it's something that God detests where we permit in ourselves what we forbid in others. And right here in the heart of this chapter, we see this going on as Athaliah cries out treason. She will condemn in another what she has more than permitted in herself. How much has she permitted this in herself? Well, pretty full on. Because if you back this story up, and if you've read through these chapters, you'll know that Athaliah is the mother of Ahaziah. And uh, Ahaziah has been killed in a kind of act of treachery. He's gone out in a battle where he's made an alliance with the king of the north, something that ought not to have been done. Uh, But in that battle, uh, the king of the north is wounded, an ambush is set, and he is put to death. Uh, When his mum hears that her son, the king of only 12 months, has been put to death, she is not happy. And in chapter 22 and verse 10, you read, When she saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. Um, How will she do that? Well, she'll do that by wiping out all of the children. But there's one child that she misses. It's the child uh, that we will know to be Joash. Uh, Jeersheba, who's effectively this young child's aunt, takes uh, this heir to the throne and hides him and will hide this child for the following six years. Verse 12 of chapter 22, he remained hidden with them at the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. So the king has been killed. His mum's not happy. She's about to wipe out any future succeeding king that would come to the throne, including this little baby. But in, and in doing so, she establishes herself to reign and to rule. Um, now, you'd have to say that is a high act of treason. And yet you skip forward in this lady's story. And when that child then is placed on the throne, she cries out, treason, treason. She will permit in herself what she will condemn in others. And then you see her undoing. In chapter 23, you'll read through about how the priest, Jehadiah, who is uh, the husband to the woman, Jehosheba, who's harboring this child, sets up in order to establish establish God's king back on the throne. And so you get the story of how he's going to assemble the Levites, a third here, a third here, and bring about a time where the king could be anointed. And the king gets anointed and everyone is ecstatic when Joash comes to the throne. And no sooner has Athaliah been put to death that the priest, Jehadiah, makes a covenant with God's people, establishes how it is they're going to worship again. And we get this great reversal in chapter 23 and verse 16. He makes a covenant. He then says to all the people, let's get to the temple and uh, Baal and tear it down. Let's smash the altars. The priest there is killed and Jehadiah places the temple back in the center of Israel's worship and all looks fantastic. And in fact, as Joash comes into reign, we're given a great picture. He'll reign for 40 years when you come to chapter 24 and he will establish what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Although there's a bit of a hint here, isn't there, in chapter in verse 2 of chapter 24? Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehadiah the priest. But what about for the years beyond Jehadiah? 
Well, that's actually the pattern. So as you read through this, you see these great reforms. The temple is about to be repaired. They're going to worship again rightly. They're going to be able to uh, gather the funds in order to build and establish uh, the articles of the temple once more so that all of the priestly sacrifices can happen. But then Jediah the priest, old and full of years, in verse 15, dies. But the good that he has done is about to be well undone. Because, verse 17, after the death of Jediah, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king and he listened to them and he abandoned the temple of the Lord. In fact, he abandons it all. And immediately we're told that worship begins again at the Asherah poles and the idols. And because of that, God's anger burns against Judah and Jerusalem. And then you read through the rest of chapter 24 and you see the spiraling effects of sin in the life of Joash. This one who had begun so well uh, now is shown to actually have been harboring exactly the same heart as before, a heart that follows after this world and its priorities. Uh, early on, you look and you see him worshipping rightly, setting about reforms, but yet uh, that which he had condemned in others, he starts to permit in himself. And here he is, worshipping and forsaking the Lord. And ultimately, he dies in the bed, uh, his own bed, killed at the hands of his officials, those that he had conspired against. And there's this circle of violence. But in all of this today, I just want us to stop and think about, before we condemn the activities of all of these seemingly wicked people, we recognise something of our own heart, don't we? That we have the same kind of capacity to condemn in others what we permit in ourselves. And this is a passage that warns us against such hypocrisy, that we ought to come humbly to a passage like this and say, we need a new heart. We need a king who actually has a heart that's not self-seeking. And of course, ultimately, we find that in Jesus, but we also find the one in Jesus who inhabits our heart, who is actually making us not seek after this world and its powers and its riches and to look with integrity at the future to say, I don't want to be saying one thing and living a different way, that I might condemn in others what I permit in myself. And so this morning, what is it that God might be focusing on for us, where we need to come and recognize our wickedness, the sinful aspect of our heart, that we might come repentant, that we might not self-justify this kind of blindness in ourselves, not seeing our own follies, because that would be fatal, as this passage warns us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, help us to look to this passage and not just read over it like an interesting story, like some kind of soap opera being played out, but real people with real lives who really rejected you. Lord, who looked into their own hearts and couldn't see their wickedness, and they would justify their own behaviour while they rejected you. Heavenly Father, would you search our hearts and see if there's any offensive way in us? Would you lead us in a way that is everlasting? Would you keep us from that kind of self-justifying blindness, but that we might humbly recognise that we need to come to your Son, to recognise where the true King is, and also to recognise, Lord, that we have a propensity to worship other things. But Lord, would you eradicate the idols of our heart and would you have us worship you rightly, fully, wholeheartedly. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.